down to the subject tonight. What are we going to do with people who are rich with gold? I tell a lot of people uh, that people of your caliber, you're richer in God than probably 90% of the earth. You know more about God. You've had more experience in God. You know more the word of God. You've had the elite uh, speakers and those who carry the revelations, fresh revelation, cutting edge stuff. You've had more than probably 90% of the rest of the earth. Now, what are we going to do with that? Does it, does it get activated in us or does it just sit there and get mildewy? You know, none of us want that to happen, but we need a plan. We need some inspiration. We might little, need a little boot to help us get going sometimes, you know? And uh, because you're really a wealth. And that's no rhetoric. That's really true. You're a wealth of understanding of God. And take God out of the picture. You're a wealth of life. You've had experiences and you've survived. How awesome is that? You're still here. Your heart's ticking. And and you're able. You're mobile. And you still have the capacity to, to share wisdom in life that can still change lives. You can give advice about jobs. You can give advice about character. You can give a lot. And uh, that's all just kind of natural life stuff. But as I say, you're also rich in God. And there's a wealth of stuff that you could share. My grandfather was a believer almost all of his life. He died at 100 years old. And so I think I got long life in my genes. And uh, more than that, I think I got a revelation. I'm not sure I have to die. I'm not sure you have to die. But that's a whole other subject. We won't go down that road tonight. But um, about my grandfather, my grandmother died when he was about 94. And uh, shortly before that, or maybe a decade before that, he just started feeling kind of sour on life. Now, he'd been a farmer all of his life. He, he says, Mark, when I was a kid, I shucked a hun- hand shuck a hundred bushels of corn in a day. Oh, wow. One hundred bushels. <laughs> That's with a team of mules, a buckboard wagon, and he's walking alongside, and you pick the corn, flow, uh, throw it up in the wagon, a hundred bushels in a day. He says, now, in later years, he ran one of these big, high-efficiency uh, combines, and he could do a hundred bushels in like 20 minutes. So he lived through all of that. And then we got old enough that his son, my uncle, felt like he was a little danger, dangerous to drive a 100000 or $150,000 machine. He couldn't drive it anymore. And for him, that took part of his identity away. The thing that he had done all of his life, now he couldn't participate in. And that was a really tough pill for him to swallow. And it left him in a really, a a kind of a dark place. He got sour on life, and he got sour on his family. And then he just kind of pined away for the last years of his life. Now, I'm sure he's going to heaven. He's, He's a good man. He just got caught in something that he hadn't prepared for. And that's a little bit of what I want to talk about to you. We need to prepare for a day, a time or a state of our lives where we may not be as mobile or capable of being accessible to people in the physical, in the natural, I mean with our physical bodies. So what are we going to do? And I'm going to tell you one thing I did. This is uh, back in the 90s, 99s, when we got our first computer. Now, you may say, well, computers are not my thing. Well, don't worry, figure out your own way. Just listen to my story just a little bit here. At that time, I figured I probably would have a last day of my life sometime. Like I said, I'm not sure I have to do that now. Which, by the way, what are you going to do with Isaiah 65 that says, in that day, if a man dies at 100 years old, to be thought of as dying as a young man? Mm -hmm. In that same context, it says if you die 
earlier than 100 years old if he thought of his dying accursed. <laughs> Two verses later, it says, my people shall live as long as trees. I don't think we're talking about a little scrub brush here. What are we going to do with that? Is anybody appropriating that? Is anybody digging the gold out of that? Is anybody mining for that to see it uh, happen in your life? Well, the truth is, I think science is doing maybe more work about that than the believer. I saw a, a front page of a Time magazine. Uh, was it Time or Newsweek? One of those had the picture of a baby. He says, this baby will probably live to be 140 years old because of the advances in science. So it sounds like science might be doing more on this project than us as believers. So what, you say, well, Mark, what are you saying? I would say, if you're interested, if something kind of clicks in you when I'm talking about this, I mean, I don't know if anybody wants to die. I mean, I understand it. Paul said, for me to die is gain. For me to live is Christ. I understand that. And there, there's going to be nothing to be uh, regretful about when we get there, wherever there is, right? But I don't think anybody of us, any of us are in a hurry. So what if we were to go after what's available in Scripture and begin to reappropriate it in our lives? Begin to mine it out. Find, find a... Uh, a foundation of faith, find a footing of, of faith that you could not only walk on yourself, but also release it into others. Amen. Now see, we're at the age of life where we're beginning to think about that more. So we had to think about that with retirement and like, what am I going to do? You know, where's my last house going to be? I heard somebody say today, I think I bought my last house and that's where I'm going to finish life. Well, that's kind of a sobering thought, you know? And I'm not sure that we have to think that way. Especially with that Isaiah 65 passage and others. So, what are we doing with that? To mind that up. Well, anyway, in 1999, we got the first computer. And I loved to write. I'd all written out longhand letters before that. And I loved I felt like I was halfway good at it. And so here came the first computer along. And I realized, wow, I can archive all of my writings. And then I can pull them out and I can edit them. Or I can file them in categories and subjects and, and who they're addressed to, what people group and that sort of thing. And so I begin realizing, wait a minute, I have an asset available to me, listen to this, that will arm me should I ever come into a time or place where I'm not as mobile as I was then. I'm still mobile right now, so I can go around the country and do stuff and it's a lot of fun. It's the best thing I've ever done in my life and I love every part of it. And so, right now, my social media connections, which would include email, blogging, Twitter, uh, text, and uh, Facebook. And so, and all of those, they are right now in the development stage. Meaning, I'm exercising them, I'm populating them, I'm trying to make connections with who they connect to, people groups. One of those social media platforms is more family. Another one is my meatiest, best stuff. You know, the, the spiritual stuff, right? Another one is fun and just crazy, wacky stuff, Instagram. And so uh, each one of them have a purpose. I'm going somewhere with this. And that is, back in 1999, how old would I have been? You see, I think I would have been uh, 45, I think. That's years ago. Is that right? Never. Yeah. Uh, okay. 44 is what I would have been. So uh, 20 years ago. It's because I'm 64. So um, I was thinking, well, if I'm not mobile someday, you know, like, like around 150 years old, I'm not quite as mobile then, right? I'm thinking long life, right? You're with me. You're going long life, right? Okay. So I'm thinking someday when I'm not mobile, how am I going to be able to export the riches that are in here? I'm trying to put together a medium, a way, a vehicle that I can continue to be relevant. I can continue to touch people's lives. Are you seeing where I'm going with this? Mm -hmm. And so what I did was, with the computer, when I got inspirations, say an inspiration about the fatherhood of God, 
I created a folder in my computer and I put everything that I could find. Verses, conversations, inspirations, revelations, anything about fatherhood, God, I put it in there. Anything about the mercy of God, anything about orphanhood, put it in there. You know, just so each folder held a whole collection of mishmash. Anything and everything, it didn't matter, I just put it in there. Then, when I would realize, wait a minute, I'm going to have to do a conference on something. I'd say, well, I don't have to now reinvent it or everything. I just go back to all the inspirations that I have and just pull those out like, oh yeah, this would be point one, this would be point two, this is point three. See, it's all there at my fingertips. Now that takes some pre-planning, pre-thinking. You got to think ahead. You got to think more than the here and now. But I'm hopeful that as time goes on, and Lord forbid, but if I lose some mobility or the ability to access people physically, that I can still do it in the social media plat- platforms. So my question would be, so what is the gold in you? Have you identified that? Which, by the way, identity is a really big deal in the church in the last maybe 10 years. You've heard probably amazing sermons about identity. Our spiritual identity, and then we've talked about personality, character traits, motivational giftings, and all kinds of stuff. Have you, have you distilled it down into something that you could articulate? Something maybe, hopefully, you've written about? Because... You see, if you're going to be relevant to somebody, you want to speak to them about something that's real in you. The best way to communicate something is to communicate it from life, from where you live it, as opposed to just from knowledge, from your head-based knowledge. And so the question is, so, uh, John, right? Uh, Mike. Oh, so so sorry, Mike. So, Mike, uh, you don't answer this, but I'm just kind of starting a little point here is that so Mike have you distilled down in a simple way to articulate who Mike is what is it that God's fashioned in you that's become your message most of us should have probably one central message that everything kind of revolves around to the mercy of God or the favor God always came through when I was down at my lowest he came through and then 10 years later it was an end God came through and God gave me the best wife, and God gave me the best kids, and you, you know, and just so there should be some theme, some central theme that becomes your central message. Now, you might have two or three other peripheral messages. You should have, probably, especially if you're going to be a little diversified and a little utilitarian. In other words, you can do several different emphasis in your life. But that one message is the one that empowers you the most through much of your life. And so, have we been able to distill that down? In other words, take all the parts and pieces, all the experiences through all the decades, and through all the phases and seasons of life, have we been able to get it down in just a couple sentences, or a paragraph? Now, guys and gals, we're all hopefully smarter than the average bear in this room. I think I heard that saying somewhere. (laughs) We're... We're, guys, there's a lot going on between our ears and there's a lot going on in our hearts. We're wealth. I said that at the very beginning. So, it probably behooves us. I like that good word. Behooves. When's the last time you heard that? It behooves us, which means it's incumbent upon us, meaning it's pressing upon us. It's inviting us to do something with the wealth. What are we going to do with it? I asked my grandfather, Grandpa, do you share in your Sunday school at class? Because he always went to church uh, every Sunday, all of his life. Well, no, they don't want to hear me. Really? Really, they don't want to hear me. Maybe that's been said in this room. My problem, the problem with my grandfather is unfortunately he didn't know how to package. And unfortunately, his brokenness came through. And so after a couple times like that, people naturally don't want to hear you. Now they respect you and they honor you because of your age and your your elder and whatever, but he didn't have a good package because his brokenness was coming through. So we've got to learn how to be good deliverers, good delivery, good presentation. 
so that we don't overstay our welcome. <laughs> we don't max out our market. <laughs> you know, what, what does that mean? Probably shorter is better than longer, maybe. Uh, and we affirm. We make sure people know that we love them. You notice how I started out? You guys are filled with gold. You're more wealthy, more rich than 90%. My kids always called it the sandwich method. You give the affirmation, put the meat in the sandwich, that's the bread. You put the meat in the sandwich, then you put some more affirmation, that's the bread on top. You know, Do the sandwich method. And so, probably in our presentation, we want to practice something like that. Now you guys can all make it very personal. It's got to be personal. You don't want to be cookie cutter of anybody. You want it to be your own personal flavor, your own personal message, your own personal style. You should ask yourself things like, am I a comedian? Is my best medium to be comedy? Do I share with humor? And I tell a few jokes and then here comes the spiritual punch on the end of the joke. Or whatever. Uh, Some of us, maybe our parable tellers, storytellers. Some of us maybe would do really good at just asking questions, just stirring inspiration, stirring thought. You don't even have to be the big guru. You just ask questions. Hey, I've been thinking about you. Let's see. Is it Dave back there? I've been thinking about you, Dave. Dave, what do you think about next Tuesday? If we were to do, and then you just flesh out the question, and you didn't even have to come up with any like huge wisdom thing. You just spark interest. And you cause their hearts to like, well, let me think about that. What do you say next Monday we meet for coffee and we talk about it? You see, there's just a whole lot of ways that we can be influencers without having to be professional public speakers. So what is that? How are you, Georgette, right? Georgette, how are you distilling the wealth, the gold that's in you in such a way that there will never be a day that you cannot uh, export it? Right now, you're probably able to touch people. You can lay hands on, you can go visit, you can hug, you can speak, whatever. What if there's a day you couldn't do that? Then how would you export the gold? See, hopefully I'm inspiring, I'm uh, hopefully triggering some thoughts so that you're thinking in your own mind, oh, that's right, what could I do with my life story or my life message? How could I put it in some kind of vehicle? to export it into somebody else's life. Passing the baton and continuing the legacy or handing the legacy off is a big deal. And each of us, I think, have the capacity to do that. That goes without saying because you're really special to God. You're super special to God. He's got amazing... Just think how it taxed God to work through your life and, and put all the wealth in I'm joking, of course. That he worked to, to take you through special circumstances. He said, I'm going to bring this influence in and these people in to put the gold in you. Now, why did he do that? Just for your own benefit? No. And most of us have tried valiantly to pass it on to our children. But how about more? How about others? And how about staying relevant and valuable Till our last breath, should there be a last breath, what would that what would that be like? Is it is that possible to activate and engage the gold that's in us? Um, I wrote down a few memory jogger things here to talk about. Um, Paul said at one point, I think it's Paul said, uh, we have many teachers. I think one version maybe says 10,000 teachers. But we don't have many fathers or mothers. And obviously there's a dearth or a lack of fathering. And we know that in our society. Hello, you know. We've got all these people that you know throw off any restraints, throw off any 
boundaries, throw off any limitations, you know, for... And uh, what do they need? Is somebody to come alongside and to care for them. Show them that, first of all, we love them, and second of all, hopefully that will go in a meaningful way than to pull forth some value in them. So how are we going to do that? So here's a little something I learned. I've got four children, and let me just say something about my children, and then I'll talk about something called currency. Currency. Remind me if I forget. So I've got four children. They're all in their 30s now. I have eight grandchildren. Three of my children uh, and their wives have, and their spouses have grandchildren. I have one. They're uh, working with uh, infertility. They, we need a breakthrough. And, uh, so, but they're all uh, strong believers. They're all spiritual leaders. They're all in the ministry. And several of them travel around the world doing uh, worship and recording. And uh, God's blessed them a lot of favor. I think the one distinctive that makes my children different than just your average recording artist or average musician is the anointing. They know how to access the anointing. Whether it's in recording, if you're just the engineer, and you say, well, how would you create anointing? Well, there's certain ways you create the ambiance that you hear in the recording, but there's also, you hear this musician, oh, right there, he's anointed. You highlight them. In the next part of the song, there's this musician that's anointed. You highlight them. But you have to have an ear for that. My point is that I think the thing that makes my children distinctive is they all know what the anointing is and they're able to create it. Able to host it, find it, create it, and bring people in with them. So I'm real proud of my children. I think they've done an excellent job despite their mom and dad. But uh, God was amazing in the way that he led us through significant seasons of our life. When they were very young... So let's just say we found ourselves making a transition to a rural place in Wisconsin when they were very young. I think it was probably the best thing we could have done for our children because we had a little farm at, they had farm animals, they had to do chores. Animals live or die based on whether you take care of them or not. And they learned birth, death, and reproduction right there on the job. So they didn't have to learn it out in the alley or in school or something. I mean, it was awesome, you know? I taught them engine mechanics, so they built uh, motorcycles and snowmobiles and stuff out of old scrap things because we we were dirt poor. So we just, you know, scavenged and said, well, let's make the best of this thing, you know. So they they did really good that way. Debbie, my wife, homeschooled. Every year she said, I don't think I can homeschool tomorrow. Let's see if we can move to a little uh, school district that was much more homey and and, uh, healthy. We could never get into that home, into that school district. We'd never find a house in that school district. And so all of my kids' childhood uh, years, uh, school years, she homeschooled, clear through graduation of high school. And so, uh, you know, you just kind of just do what you have to do <laughs> during that time. But here's the point I want to make back about currency. Every child is different, and every one of your disciples are different. Everyone in this room is different. So, But if we're going to take people in under our wing, we've got to learn how to be diverse, how to be sensitive to what their uniqueness is. How are they different? And so I'm going to make a a little point here. Let's say if we went to Russia, I think they use ruples there, don't they? Mm -hmm. Still? Okay, and uh, if we took yen, I think Japanese, is it yen? Okay, so if we took Japanese yen with us to Russia and tried to buy something, how would that work? It wouldn't. It wouldn't work. Why? It's not their currency. It's not their currency. Very well said, Meg. It's not their currency. Now, is yen valuable? Yes. Uh, the Japanese, it's, it's their main way of buying and selling, right? So it is valuable, but it's not valuable to Russians. You probably know where I'm going. So if you've got gold in you, it is really valuable. Very valuable. God thinks it's valuable, and we do too. But if you want to export it to somebody who doesn't value gold, maybe they value time. 
time well spent with them. And so you say, I'm just going to give you the facts, bro. I just want to deliver, unload this truckload of facts on you, and, and you're going to have to do the best you can with it, you know. They say, well, okay, thank you kindly, but I think I'll move on. You get the point? Every disciple, every child, every individual that we're reaching out to has to have a different, probably has to have a very different kind of currency. Now, I realize there's some similarities, but we have to have a different currency. Uh, You've read probably the book, uh, is it the Five Languages of Love? or Five Love Languages. So what are they? Somebody help me. Time, words of affirmation, acts of service. Say a little bit louder, start over. Quality time, words of affirmation, acts of service, Physical touch. Gifts. <laughs> and gifts. Who gives <laughs> okay, that's just five. But then it breaks down into subgroups of each one of those when we go to actually get into their hearts, especially when we're talking about our children, or in this case, more appropriately, our disciples, which is a point that I think is very significant. When Jesus sent the disciples out of Jerusalem with the Great Commission, he says, Go ye therefore into all the world and make disciples of all the nations, right? Why do you think Jesus said that? Was it to propagate the gospel? Yes. Probably a good answer. Expansion of the kingdom? Okay. I think that's true. I think that's a good answer. But I think there's a more visceral or more core reason. And that is, Jesus knew if they stayed in Jerusalem, they'd dry up and blow away. Just be us four and no more, and we prophesied over everybody, and, well, (laughs) prophecy gift just kind of dwindles then, because I don't got faith to prophesy over you, because I already did it a thousand times. (laughs) And you know what? There were only a few that left Jerusalem, willingly. But then there came this big motivator, (laughs) called, was it Titus? from Rome and sacked Rome and guess what we have motivation to leave Jerusalem now (laughs) and you see what happens when you get in fresh territory with fresh people that you have to deliver you got to have something from God for them it makes you scratch gravel with God it makes you walk cleaner makes you have your antennas up more consistently when you know that you're going to face Little Susie next week. Shelly, you're going to have Susie for coffee and you've been discipling her. Uh, oh, sorry, Susie. Um, I, Susie's my kind of generic word. Uh, so let's just say you got little Jenny that you're going to decide, you're discipling and you're going to meet her next week and she's in a situation that needs some answers. Probably all this week, while you're working, while you're playing, while you're relational, while you're cooking, while you're going and coming, you're saying, God, I'm going to meet Jenny. I got my antennas up. Is there any download you want to give me for her? And you know that you hear better when you walk more cleanly before the Lord. I'm not saying it bothers God when we got stuff in our life, but it sure makes a problem for our hearing process on our end. And so we know when we walk cleaner, then we hear better. We're able to receive better. And we're able to deliver better. And so all week, I'm going to have my antennas up. I'm going to listen better than I normally would normally would listen. And I'm going to walk better before the Lord. I might even be a little more intentional in my devotion. Not like I'm trying to twist God's arm. It's just I want to walk with Him. I want to do His stuff with Him. And I just want to walk where there's no barriers or resistance. So I'm just going to walk all week really careful. What is it, God, you got for Jenny? Now, what do you think that's going to do for your spirit if that's a normal mode of life? It will. It'll keep you on 10. It'll keep you polished up, man. You're shining like, whoa, you could do anything. You could be in season, in season, out of season because that's your normal mode. That's your MO. So if you don't have disciples, what do we tend to do? Well, okay, gee, shucks, you know. You know, I'll try to go to church next Sunday. And, and, you know, well, I heard that sermon before. You know, it was a good sermon. It was a good sermon, but 
you guys, listen, that's not to be a slam on anything. Because you guys are already so rich, you should have heard almost every sermon there would be preached. I'm serious. I'm totally serious. You could probably and should probably be able to preach almost every sermon that you would hear in the local church. (coughs) You should be able to take it outside the church and be able to preach it. So why do we have fried preacher for dinner on Sunday? We shouldn't. We shouldn't. I'm not saying we shouldn't fry preachers. We we shouldn't do that, but that's not my point. My point is, why would we get exasperated when, well, I think I've heard that before? It's because you probably have. Because you're rich enough that you should probably be able to preach that. Not at the church. You're just not enough pulpit time for all of you, okay? That's just sheer practicality issues. But where could you preach it? To little Jenny? When you meet Jenny? When you meet your disciple? Now you're going to bail your hay. You're going to package so it's presentable in the right currency. Whoever was preaching that Sunday, they have a certain currency they're preaching. But Jenny needs a different kind of currency. So you're the mediator. You're the, you're the you know, in the airports where you have the, the cash uh, exchange. exchange, currency exchange. You're the currency exchanger. Because why? You're experienced. You know the five languages of love. You know the different currency principle. And you've heard that sermon preached from a lot of different angles. It's already back in your archives of your computer in here. And so you said, wait a minute, I heard it given like this, but Jenny needs it like this. Okay, let's pull this out of that file. And Jenny, you know what? Instead of me preaching you something, let's go do something. Is this making any sparks go off at all? I, what I'm wanting to do is give you some tools to activate what you already are what you're already capable of, without a doubt, and to prepare you for a time when you may be a little frustrated with, how do I export? Well, here's some ideas. You going with me so far? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If we had time, and this is too big of a group to do such a thing like this, but if we had time, it would really be great if there, and maybe... Somewhere in the future, you guys might do something like this. But you say, let's take four people during our gathering this week, and let's unpack who they are, and let's see, the rest of us, if we can establish what their message is. And we can affirm them in their message. And they may not know how to present their message, but while they were telling the story, we were taking notes, just like me with my buddy Donnie. In 30 minutes, I had four sermons for him. The guy is well capable of preaching, literally. So I have four sermons for him. We could do that as a group. And before very long, we've empowered every one of us. And then somebody said, well, where would I share it? Okay, let me see. Now, you live in uh, Escondido. Okay, Escondido, let's see, there's this old folks home, and guess what? They are always looking for help. Always looking for somebody to give hugs, give inspiration, bring music whatever. My mother's 84 years old. And about three, four years ago, she'd lost her husband. Not my father, but... Uh, uh, okay, sorry. Go down that road. Anyway, uh, you know, sometimes you go down a rabbit road. How do I get out of that rabbit hole? Anyway, so she was uh, wondering, well, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I said, Mom, where's the nearest convalescent or geriatric home? Where is it? She said, oh yeah, it's right down here. I've already seen it. Okay, I said, those people would be delighted to have you come. She's a great pianist, and she can sing. She knows all the hymns that they would know, all the oldie goldies, right? And I said, why don't you go down there and ask them if they would like you to do something like that? Well, at first she was kind of like, no, 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 I'm not into that thing. Well, guess what she did? She went down there and asked them, and they said, well, yeah, how about you come next Thursday? She did almost two hours and she was inspired. It was amazing. She did things. She, she'd say, I'm going to sing the first three notes of this old hymn. Somebody tell me who this is. Or what, verse, or, or what song this is. And she interacted with them. When it got all done, the manager of the convalescent home came up and says, okay, we have all these dates, so we got you down this date and this date and this date and this date. Now, mom, mom, if she wanted that, 
She could have had carte blanche right in there, man. She could have been going to her last breath. That's not exactly who my mom is. She's not a real people person in groups. She likes more one-on-one. So guess what she's done? She says, I've visited 26 churches in my, in my uh, area, Goodlitzville, Tennessee. I visited 26 churches. Not because I'm looking for a church to go to. Her church meets on, well, it used to meet on Tuesday morning. Now it meets on Sunday morning. But before it moved to Sunday morning, uh, she said, on Sunday morning I go to 26 churches. She says, because I want to see what God's doing. And when she go in there, she says, I'm looking around like, God, is there anybody I need to meet with? And just every little bit, she'd say, I saw that lady over there, and I saw her do something, and it really touched me. I felt like the Lord said, take her out to dinner. So they'd go to old uh, Cracker Barrel. That's her <laughs> favorite deal. Go to Cracker Barrel, and then before very long, they, she'd have her over to their house, and they'd watch, uh, what's that movie? Uh, Fireproof or... Uh, the intercessor lady and the war room. War room. yeah war room she brought the dvd set dvd set and the study dvd set and the books to go with it and so she just kind of gets them in and pretty soon she's ministered to them just one on one and then usher them back out so look at her my mom i'm pretty proud of her you know i didn't know if she's going to be able to kind of gird up her loins and get with it but she's doing really good She's 84 years old, guys. How many is 84 years old in here? So, we can do this stuff. We can activate the gold that's in us if we just won't let conventional, normal, churchianity hogtie us in our mind. Churchianity, uh, let's say, any normal church, any conventional church, doesn't intend to hogtie any of us. But if we let it, it will. It creates. It can create strongholds between our ears. They say, well, I don't have any place. My pastor's not endorsing me, not laying hands on me or whatever. Guys, they just don't have time to lay hands on everybody. So Jesus has already given you the commission. So let's go do it. Yeah? Yeah? I told a group the other day. Now, this is another little subject. I told a group the other day, probably one of the biggest enemies, one of the biggest liabilities to humanity in general, and more specifically, to believers. You want to know what that is? Is it big uh, cardinal sins? Like adultery. That's that's the biggest thing. Right, it keeps everybody down. No, I don't think so. Murder. Murder, that's it. No, no. It's something you wouldn't guess, I think. This is my perspective. It's something you just wouldn't guess. You wouldn't think about it. In fact, you probably don't think this is a problem to you. When it, I think it might be. And this thing that I'm going to talk about is so gradual. It kind of just infiltrates. In fact... Uh, it, it just comes in so we don't know it until it's kind of it, well it's got us in a stronghold until we can't function and we think we're just useless you want to know what it is it's called boredom boredom is this it seems noxious or innocent noxious is not the word innocuous I think sorry I think that's the word I was looking for are innocent. Seems innocent. Seems like, okay, so what's the problem with that? So we have a down week and we're not really inspired. Okay, whatever. And then we have two weeks. And then we have a month and we're not inspired. And it's like, what is that about? Well, okay, that's just life. I'm getting older, so, you know, I'll just sit in my rocker and watch as the world turns or something. <laughs> that's we're going way back in it. My great grandmother watched that. And, uh, but uh, there we just sit. Well, I guess I'll just rock my last days out, you know. Yeah, I got my glider. Yeah, so there we go. And what happens? What do you think God thinks about this? You have this wealth, 
You have this gold mine, this treasure trove of wealth in you. And God says, don't just let it sit there. It's going to get moldy and moth and stuff will get in there, you know? And, and, and But what boredom does, it kind of takes the teeth out of our edge. It takes the 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 edge off of our words and off of our passion. And pretty soon they're like, I used to have passion for stuff. I used to really like reading the Word of God. And I know it's good, and so I just still read it, but it just doesn't seem like it pops out at me anymore. And so we just kind of go through, and boredom just kind of nibbles away at us. Just nibbles away until passion and vibrance is just kind of a thing of the past. It's a memory. I don't think it needs to be that way at all. But it will take some girding up of our loins, so to speak. It will take some, bless God, I'm driving a stake. I will not allow one more week to go by without me laying hold of the horns of the altar, whether that's heaven or my issues, my circumstances, my message, my whatever it is. I'm going to get a hold of this thing because I'm not going down to the grave, should we go to the grave, I'm not going down to the grave mousy and unempowered. How would you like to be, and this is, I've told a lot of people this, should I die, I'd like to have a little notice because I'd like to do it like Jacob. Jacob gathered all of his sons around. Joseph and his sons. He gathered them all around. Gather around, boys. We're going to do some prophesying here. And he prophesied over everyone. He called forth their destiny, called forth their land, called forth their characteristics. He gave them pictures to think about, you know, picturesque uh, prophetic language. Prophesied over every one of them. And do you know what it says right after that? It says he gathered his feet up in his bed and died. I figure... I do not want to go out life, first of all, scratching and screaming and clawing for another inch of life. Neither do I want to go out of life whimp, uh, whimpering and, and mousy. I want to go out in grand style if I have to go out of life. Do I have any, uh, anybody says amen to that? Because I'm talking to the right crowd. I want to go out with my spirit man fully engaged. Now, you have a good spirit. You have a spirit even if you're from Mousy. Your spirit man is, if you're a believer, it's, you're a new creation. So your spirit man's whole and complete, holy and perfect and all that. But your soul man is the part that gets dumbed down. I want my soul man to be fully alive, engaged, electricity going through me. You know, so that I'm dangerous, I'm contagious, infectious. Am I talking to the right crowd? Yes. So, that's going to take some activation. And guess what? Guess what? We're probably not going to get as much encouragement as we'd like. But now it's time to be fathers and mothers. And fathers and mothers don't always do what they have to do and what they need to do based on the encouragement or feedback that they get back. Any of you that are real mommies and daddies know that, right? You do it, why? Why? Because it's the right thing to do. And at this stage of the life, at this stage of life, not only is it the right thing to do under God, but let me give you another reason. It's a recipe for staying alive. Amen. On my blog, I wrote a post some years ago, and the title was Staying Alive. And I gave a few tips, a few tools, included, including some of these I'm talking about now. How do you stay alive spiritually? so that you're vibrant and relevant. And you can speak with different currencies at different times. You know, if I was speaking to individuals in this group, I would probably tailor what I'm saying. But we're talking as a group, so we kind of have to do a generic and general thing here. But I would try to use different currency for different ones. And that's what we have to do. I mentioned that earlier. So, how do you stay alive? I think we've got to have disciples current disciples. Thank God for all the past disciples. That's really awesome. And some of you have some amazing trophies on the mantle of your life. Sitting up there like, you know, some people have their gold ribbons and blue uh, blue ribbons and their gold uh, trophies and all kinds of stuff. And some of you have a lot of those in your life, in your past. 
But none of us want to say, well, that's enough. Or, worse yet, go out of life whimpering and bemoaning our situation, unfortunately, like my grandfather. And so, it's time to gear up. It'd be nice if Mike and Borny and Larry and others could just lay hands on you and call forth the gold and prophesy you know, words of knowledge and not only where you are and, your, and who you are as a person, but the person you're supposed to meet next week. Like, I see a guy named Jimmy and you're going to meet him at Starbucks. And that wouldn't that be awesome? That'd be totally cool. If Borny, Mike and Larry and others could do that. Wouldn't it? That'd just be awesome. Mm-hmm. Except you know something? You wouldn't grow. You wouldn't grow like you should. You wouldn't grow like you could. You're not sure? So how many of you ever work out at a gym? John does. You work out at a gym. Do you realize to grow, or to at least stay in shape, you have to experience some kind of pain. You have to uh, uh, initiate a regimen that pushes you in the pain zone. Now it may not be like shooting pain, but working up a lather, sweat, is not exactly fun, and why, so why do you do it? Because you know you should in order to stay alive. This morning I went with Bill and uh, Mike down to Torrey Pines. We had a great time. Guess what? We were huffing and puffing. Guess what? We peeled off layers. And we did it for multiple reasons. Part of it stay alive. There are layers in my backpack. Oh, Bill, 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 Bill. We're not bitter, are we? He just threw us under the bus. <laughs> man, oh man. <laughs> I know. I'm grateful. That felt like love. That felt like love right there. No, we had a great time. And we talked about just good stuff. We kicked around spiritual stuff. We kicked around real life stuff. And then we did it for our physical bodies. Why again do we do it? To stay alive. So what's the recipe for your life? How are you going to activate? How are you going to exercise? And I don't mean just physical, although it probably requires some of that. How are you going to exercise your soul man? How are you going to exercise the message that God has formed in you, whether you realize what that message is or not? How are you going to identify it and exercise it? The question is then, after that, is who are you going to export it to? Should you get on the elliptical today? Should you get on a treadmill? Should you do free weights? Should you do the machines? What should you do? Upper body? Aerobic? What should you do today? That's where we're going to have to listen and be some self-starters, which takes me to another (coughs) subject. Paul, or I think it was Hebrews, so whoever wrote Hebrews, I believe he's the one who wrote it, said, uh, by now we should be able to uh, eat strong meat. And I'm not going to be able to quote this right. Somebody quote it, but you're, able, you're only able to have the sincere milk of the word. Mm-hmm. That's pretty close. I'm murdering it, but you get the idea. And so, what is the difference between strong meat and milk? I don't think the milk is John 3.16 and the strong meat is something out of Revelation. I, I, and I, that might be something, but I think it's something more actually simple and yet profound. And that is this. Strong meat, if you think about it, uh, let's go back, let's start with milk. Milk is something that has been processed by somebody else. You mamas know all about that. Animal kingdom, we know all about that. So mamas eat food, then their body processes it, and then they give it to the baby who wouldn't possibly be able to eat meat, right? So what is sincere milk of the word? It's somebody has processed the word for you so that it's palatable, so you don't choke on it. So we're still only ready for mushy peas and pablum and cereal and the Gerber's baby bottle. That's what those who can only drink uh, sincere milk of the word are. They They don't know how to find the revelation, the rhema, the food from God for themselves. But meat eaters don't need somebody to process it for them. They're hunter-gatherers. 
if you lived in a rural community, you would hunt. Bill and I were talking this morning with the city guy here, Michael. <laughs> we're talking about being hunters, you know, living off the land, or eating raccoon, how you like that, beaver and uh, deer and just all kinds of crazy stuff. And snapping turtle. How do you like that? Does that sound good? It is. It is. And we both had eaten all of those. And so it's just, and a host of more. But you live off the land. What do you do? You hunt and gather. You bring it in so you have something to eat. So what is strong meat and sincere milk of the word? Strong meat is those who know how to go into the word of God or in the relationship with God and get meat from God, get food from God for themselves. They're able to be self-sustainers, or another word is self-feeders. Question is, are you a self-feeder? Probably. <coughs> Most are in this room, hopefully all of us. But that's mandatory. Mandatory, especially at this stage in life, especially when we're as rich as we are in God. We really need to be self-feeders. In other words, get our own message from God. And you know what that would do? That would sure ease the load for the preacher man or preacher woman. Then we wouldn't put the pressure on them to have to deliver something I've never heard before. Wouldn't that be good, uh, preacher guys? <laughs> Takes the pressure off of you. Because your group knows how to feed themselves. And so when they come, they come loaded for, you know what, I'm going to meet Jenny. Just kind of stick with that one. Jenny's now coming to church. And uh, I've got something fresh for Jenny this morning. And you know what, I'm going to in, uh, introduce her to Meg. And she needs to meet Meg. And uh, you know what, I think that's going to be the, a really good connection. You see, we begin to take, bring others under our wings, <coughs> begin to exercise and ply our trade. Ply, so to speak. Ply the gold that's in us. Let me see, I got a, if I got one or two more things, and then I'd just like to hear commentary, and we'll see where we go with that. So you say, well, I don't know if they really value me or listen to me or whatever. Well, maybe they don't know what's in your mind, what's in your heart. They don't know the gold. So what are you going to do? So I recommend this. You start small. You start giving away. You'll be a giver. You'll be a taker at this stage of life. Most of us should be able to be primarily givers. I understand we still need from God, but we probably don't need too much from people unless or until we're in a pickle or in a jam. And that's totally cool because that's what we humans are, frail. And so when that happens, then we certainly need the body. But we need to be primarily givers at this stage of our life because of the sheer fact that we're a treasure trove of gold. Okay, so what do I do with it? Well, I begin giving it away. We're sticking with Jenny. So we give, Shelly's giving into Jenny, just pouring into Jenny, pouring into Jenny. And guess what Jenny says? Uh, could I bring Tammy over with us for the next coffee? Yep, you can. So we give away. Now, let's say nobody knows Shelly, and, and so uh, Jenny is telling Tammy about it. Tammy's come along. Pretty soon Tammy is telling... Um, Mary, and now you've got this little group, and pretty soon uh, your house church leader, who hasn't really ever figured out what Shelley's got to offer, says, well, wait a minute, what is this? You're bringing uh, Jenny, and you're bringing Tammy, and you're bringing Mary to this? What's going on? What are you doing? I mean, like, this is really cool. Like, nobody else has brought people to the house church, and here you're bringing all your disciples, and this is really cool. So now your gift, listen to this, and this is Proverbs, your gift is beginning to make room for you. What you do is you apply your trade, you give it away, its effectiveness, its influence begins to speak for you. You don't even have to promote yourself because your gift begins to promote you. It goes out, Jenny told Tammy, Tammy told Mary, and pretty soon the three of them told the house church leader, and the house church leader says, oh my gosh, you know, we got this, we got this powerhouse over here, Shelly, and we need to tap into this, you know, we need to, you get the point. Now, that's all hypothetical. I'm not trying to prophesy anything at that point. I'm just telling principles. You see how, if you be a giver with what you got, Marisha, 
Is that right? Am I saying it right? Yeah. You say you be a giver of what you got. Eric, you do what you give what you got. I saw you Sunday morning. You were scurrying around like a chicken with a head cut off. Good job. You were just getting everything all put in place. So, but you give what you got, and you let your gift do the promotion for you. Which is, by the way, the way you want it, because the Bible says promotion or increase comes from the Lord. That's the best way for it to happen anyway. So how do you get known? How do you, how do you let people know? And, uh, and you get the point, because all of us humans want to be recognized. Well, just practice being a giver, like mommies and daddies do, irregardless of whether you're being asked or somehow authorized to do it. You just give what you know you can give. Give it in a way that is not stepping on anybody else's toes. You're not usurping anybody else's territory. See, little Jenny, she was just a pre-Christian out there in the middle of the world. Uh, that's open territory for any. You can do anything you want. There's no limitations. Just go for Jenny for all you want. But if you got somebody in the church, you might want to just be careful who you talk with. You're kind of like, okay, I think, uh, I think, oh gosh, I'm reaching for names here. Let's say Margaret has got... Uh, uh, Geraldine as her disciple. So I want to be careful as I walk into Geraldine's life because Geraldine is just walking with Margaret. You get the point here. So when you're in certain contexts, certain relationships, you got to walk circumspectly, respectfully. When you're out in the world, man, sky's the limit. Just go for it. That's why I told my mother, Go to that old folks home, man, you can do anything you want. They're going to love you till, till kingdom come, which, by the way, it's already here. But anyway, <laughs> isn't it crazy how we say some sayings that just, I used to say, I'll be doing that till I die. I used to say, uh, I'll be doing that till Jesus come. Well, I don't say that anymore because he's just come so many times, even tonight in a room in Revelation, whatever. I don't say that. You say till the kingdom come and I don't say that anymore because kingdom's here. Jesus told us that. I used to stay till I die. I don't say that anymore. So you know, we've got to upgrade our vocabulary. Let me see. Let's hope maybe overload, but let's just see here. Okay, one last, one last point. <clears throat> Anybody who's involved or knows anything about medicine and uh, sickness, disease health, that kind of thing. I think it's true, you can help me with this, but I think it's true that we're most communicable when we have a fever. Is that right? Or the pathogens or whatever they call them? Is that when it comes out of our body? Would anybody know? Okay, so I'm going somewhere with this, so it may not be a completely accurate parallel. But when we have a fever, we say, ah, don't go to that person's house, or don't come to church, or don't go to school or whatever when you got a fever because why that's when you're communicable or contagious it's contagious. Mm-hmm. So when you're contagious and so you know where the parallel is prob- probably going where you're most contagious in the good sense of the word with your spiritual wealth is if you're hot and if you got a fever mm. if you've got a fever it won't be a problem having a crowd. I think it was... I'm sorry, I always get confused. I don't know if it's John Wesley. Uh, it might be him. Is that yourself on fire? Yeah. Is it him? He, they, somebody asked him, so how do you get crowds to come to your meetings? He says, I set myself on fire and people come to watch me burn. <laughs> <laughs> so, the question is, are we hot? Are we hot? Do we have a fever? See, so if you want to be effective, are we hot? Do we have the capacity to be contagious by our shadow? Uh, was it St. Francis of Assisi said, uh, preach always and if necessary use words. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, just by your presence. I was telling uh, Larry, he says, what are you doing in Israel? Well, guess what? We're not doing conventional evangelism. 
because we're ministering to Orthodox Jews. So they don't want to hear about Jesus, they don't want to hear about the gospel. Well, that's not a problem. I've got a ton of stuff I can talk about. Besides, I am Jesus. We are as he is in this world. Yes, can you go with me on this? Yeah. I'm the carrier, I'm the bearer of light. I'm the possessor, the personification of Jesus. So I don't have to talk about it, just be him. So what they do like is talk about miracles, talk about God, and share testimonies. There's no license or limit on that. You can share that all day long. And many times we're sharing about it. Tears are start running down their cheeks and they come afterwards. Could, could you come to our house for Shabbat meal and tell more about this? You better believe it, we can. And to my knowledge, we haven't talked about Jesus or try to get people saved. Do you think that their hearts are awakened to God, though? Yeah. You better believe they are. Because why? When, I, when their tears are going down their cheeks, it started with tears coming down my cheeks. Contagious people get people infected. So get hot. Get a fever. And you say, well, how do they do that? Just read the Bible more and read harder and do it wrong harder or whatever? No, that was... How do I do it? Well, it's going to be different for every one of you. But find what it is. I'll give you two or three tips and then uh, I'll take a breath. (laughs) I have on my phone and in my car and a hard drive on my car and in my laptop, I have a collection of songs, maybe 60 or 70, and I keep adding to them as I find it. I keep adding to this collection as I find songs. But these are the songs that make me cry. I happen to believe that tears are one of the ways that we know the Spirit of God is resting on us. In my personal experience, I'm absolutely convinced of it. Now, there are other ways we know, too. It's not the only way. But it's one of the surest ways. It's one of the ways that I can't do hamburger helper because I can't make help, tears happen. And so when God, when tears come, I'm like, okay, there we are. Yep, we're in now. And so when I've heard, <laughs> when I hear a song that makes me cry, latch on to that. Because I want to stay alive. And so guess what? I do not turn on Christian radio. I do not turn on Christian even music radio. Sadly, it's too fluffy for me. And sadly, a lot of it's bad theology. Now, there's a lot of good stuff. And for newbies, it's great, okay? But not in this room. For newbies, pre-Christians, whatever, it gets them rolling. It gets the ball rolling. It's good. And the good thing about God is He's able to take us anywhere in the spectrum. Even when we're before the spectrum, you know, pre-Christian, He's like... I got you covered. I got something for you, you know. So it's great. But you and I need to know how to go find meat. And the meat for me was I found songs that made me cry. Okay, that is not going to be like sand or water through my fingers. I am pulling that into a retrievable way that I can listen to that and marinate my heart. You ask my wife. We go on trips or drive up to the North Country or whatever, anything under eight or ten hours we usually drive to. So I got this thing playing all day long, all trip long, and she's like, "Okay, when you, you know, I've got tears running down my cheeks as I'm driving, you know, and then I put that song on repeat." She's okay. About the fiftieth time, that should be about enough, you know. <laughs> What's your favorite song? Oh, it's I got several, uh, and you probably never heard them. One of them is uh, uh, Misty uh, Edwards from IHOP, and the, it's a it's a spontaneous song. It's it's eight minutes long. It's titled entitled "I Love You." Just go to YouTube and listen to that. It'll wreck you. It'll just wreck you. It's just like, oh my God, God, you're just so good, you know. Misty Edwards on YouTube. Misty Edwards, "I Love You." Yeah, that's one of them. I got about six that are my hottest ones. David Brimer's got one. It just gets me. It just and uh, and so where was it going with that? Oh yeah. So I just marinate myself because why? <laughs> I want to stay hot. And why do I want to stay hot? First of all, there's better connection this way, better flow this way. But second, there's better contagious things going on. I've seen all your days, and I've seen all your nights.
the touch, the warmth, the arm around his shoulder, the listening ear. Lord, it would be so power-packed. Lord, there's no need for boredom at this stage of life, not as wealthy as we are. No need, Lord. And we just speak that over each one, Lord. The boredom would be a stranger. Boredom would be a strange and foreign idea because every heart's been inspired freshly, walking currently in the fresh graces of God. Bless them, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. And I exalt thee. Yeah, we do. Oh, I exalt thee. Oh, I exalt thee. Oh, Lord. Yeah, we do. Oh, we do. Yes, and I